Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Grand Rounds. Uh, first, a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, we uh, would like to have everybody participate and uh, join by web, and you can go to polev.com, uh, enter DeBakey, uh, and uh, feel free to enter in uh, questions for the speaker, or you can join by text. That's uh, text DeBakey to 37607. And uh, type in your message and we'll have time for questions at the end. Today, it is really a, an honor, uh, it's a privilege, and, and, and more importantly, a pleasure to welcome uh, my good friend and all of our good friends, Vino Tarani. Uh, Vino is an international leader in not just cardiac surgery, but uh, cardiac disease. He is the Bernie Marcus Chair uh, in the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery and the Director of the Marcus Val Center and Structural Center of Excellence at Piedmont Heart Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, uh, that Vino spent much of his uh, career at Emory. He was a professor of surgery at Emory, uh, spent a little time in Washington, D.C., where he was a professor of surgery at Georgetown before coming to Piedmont. Um, uh, Vino is uh, a cardiac surgery superstar. I'd say he's a member of the Holy Trinity of cardiac surgery structural heart disease, along with uh, our own Mike Reardon and Mike Mack. Uh, and Vino, the three of them together, have really made uh, a huge impact in structural heart disease from the surgical side of things. Uh, Vino, in addition to his work at Piedmont, holds an extraordinary number of leadership positions in, uh, in cardiac surgery and in, in cardiology. He's the current president of the Southern Thoracic Surgical Association. He's the president of the Heart Valve Society. He's the president-elect of uh, the International Society of Minimally Invasive Cardiothoracic Surgery. He serves on the board of directors and the executive committee as the treasurer of the Society of Thoracic Surgery. Uh, he is uh, the co-chair of the STS uh, ACC TVT uh, database. He's authored uh, over 620 uh, peer-reviewed papers. In, in his spare time, he has an incredibly busy, uh, incredibly successful cardiac surgery practice uh, in Atlanta. So it's, it really is a distinct honor and a pleasure to welcome you, Vino, and today, Vino is going to talk about an appropriate title, The Wild Wild West, The Current Management Strategies for Mitral and Tricuspid Valve Diseases. Vino? Great. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm uh, humbled and honored to be here. I'm not sure I'll live up to, to that introduction, but thank you so much, and I really appreciate it. And, and, I've, and as I sat over dinner last night, I was just thinking about how incredible of a group that you have here uh, at the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center, led by you and Mike Reardon and just Mahesh Ramjandani and, and, and everybody else. So really um, honored to be here. Thank you um, so much. These are my disclosures. Um, I love research, and so um, that's a lot of the stuff that, I, uh, that I'll work on. I, I thought it would be just nice to show you a little bit about Atlanta and where we are at the Piedmont Heart Institute. This is our Atlanta campus. We're very similar to, to you guys in the sense that uh, we're also a um, network of hospitals. We're one of, uh, this is one of 18 hospitals in Georgia. This is our newest tower. I know your, your new tower is gonna be coming up also. This is our um, tower for heart and vascular that we have by the philanthropy of Bernie Marcus um, on the front and back side of it. It'll be an addition to our campus and, um, and very similar to, to the way the Methodist program is built. Uh, and this is just the front lobby of, of what they were able to do This just opened a year ago. So really a fun place to be. It's, I think it's just a spark of energy where we have. I, I always give credit to, to the team that, that works with me. This is my work family um, of cardiac surgeons uh, that we have um, at Piedmont. I'm just honored to be one of their partners. But really, uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is, you know, the treasures of our valve center are these two guys, and we'll have a third coming in September. Um, Pradeep and Vivek are absolutely um, the gems of the program, and I just come, uh, my office is tucked in between the two of them. I'm not sure that's probably smart uh, of my part, but they flank me on either side, and they are absolutely um, 
uh, true treasures. I, I really couldn't do anything that I do without, without the two of these guys. We're not just a private practice program like you. We also do a lot of research trials. In fact, we're doing now 29 valve research trials um, that we're working on. So research is unbelievably important to us and is the crux of what we do. And we love to publish and in the last three years have, have put together over 200 um, publications um, on valve disease. So um, I follow the lead of Mike Reardon and, and Mike Mack. I, I, I'm really not the trifecta with them. I'm the, their stepchild somehow together if they were to have a child. And so um, really are honored to be with those guys. I think it's important when people and leaders do something, they, they walk the walk and they talk the talk. And I think that's important for people who give these type of lectures to understand what we do. And I thought uh, Pradeep and I put this list together from 2021. So in the mitral tricuspid space, uh, just for that one year, we did about 95 mitral clips. We did seven patients in the repair MR trial. We do about 30, 35 my sapiens and mitrals. We did about, and these are the things that we'll talk about later in this presentation. We did 20 tendine transapical uh, mitral valve replacements that puts us high up in the roller. We just started the trial last February, so we were able to do 20. In the past, before we did tendine, and I'll talk about this technology coming up, we had done 22 transapical intrepid, so a decent amount of volume that we really spend a lot of energy on. Pascal 2F and 2D were, uh, have done 18 of those last year. And in High Life, we did the first one in North America last year. That patient is doing well, and I'll show you some videos of that. And the Sophia will be the first in the U.S. Uh, to do that next Thursday uh, in the hybrid room. So it's really, we're, put, we're trying to push the envelope of walking the walk and talking the talk. And the tricuspid will do about 30 triclips last year, five patients in the Triluminate trial, which you're also a part of here. Probably the most exciting thing that I did last year was 20 tricuspid valve replacements, Tom, all through a needle stick. So it is uh, staggering to me that we can do that. Uh, we did one Compassion Intrepid TVR, not last year, but in the past, and four trisols uh, have been submitted. So really pushing the envelope in one year of what we can do in transcatheter technology. Our topic today will be primary, secondary MR, and then tricuspid regurgitation. It is all because we believe heavily, just like you do here with Sachin and, and uh, Moritz and uh, Mike and others um, and Mahesh on the expanded heart team. I think this is important. We live it. Pradeep, Vivek, I, Jim Cowton see patients on Monday. We saw between the four of us, we see them at the same time together. Um, we saw about 45 patients in our valve clinic on Monday together amongst the four of us, two surgeons, two cardiologists in the spa same space with the same nurses at the same time. So we're really able to, I feel like, treat that heart patient very well. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to get the right procedure in the right patient at the right time for the right reason. We have to remember it's got to be the patient that's in the middle. Just stepping back now, we've talked a little bit about what we've done in the future. I think it's important to learn that, for, especially for the, uh, the residents and some of the medical students, you know, Vesalius really is the one who named this uh, uh, mitral valve, uh, named on the mitra, and you can see kind of the, uh, the relationship of what it looks like for um, the Pope's hat and versus the mitral valve, and that's really where the origins were. Gaudi really was a big um, studier of Vesalius, and you can see that the Sagrada Familia that he uh, constructed and designed is very similar to the mitral valve. In fact, if you look the inside of a mitral valve and the inside of the sagra, Sagrada, you can see the architecture is very similar towards that. And this was something that was going back in the early 1900s. We owe, I'm a big believer in history, and we really owe a lot of people, and you, these are, um, you, you know some of these people, I've heard of some of these people, right, Tom? They were in your Northeast area for a long time. No, I didn't say that. I didn't, of course, not born during that time period, but of course, these are people that were, uh, that were ingrained in your education up in the Northeast. And I think we won't go through this slide, but what it shows you, I'll show you really on the fourth and fifth attempt, you have two mitral valve operations uh, scheduled in the same day in separate places. One, 8 a.m. at the Philadelphia General Hospital, and the second one was at 2 p.m. across town in the Episcopal Hospital. Uh, fourth attempt, 30-year-old man died on, uh, uh, also from asystole. He changed his suit, drove to the next hospital, and did the fifth case. It was a 24-year-old housewife with a rheumatic mitral valve disease. And Claire at that time could not care for her children. She could not draw a good breath, and medication did nothing to help her. 
uh, Mrs. Ward's primary physician advised her not to have the operation, knowing that three of them, he didn't know about the fourth one, three of them before had all died. Dr. Bailey treated her MS with a hook knife. Post-op uh, post day three, she was up and walking. On day seven, he brought her to Chicago to show her off at the ACCP meeting, and that was the beginning, really, of contemporary mitral valve surgery. Luckily, he had no IRB, so nobody wrote him up, but that's the beginning, and I think we have to remember that how important innovation is. Mitral valve disease is very prevalent, more so than aortic valve disease. Uh, we, we're, we're very similar to Methodist Hospital. We do north of 400 towers a year, and our mitral valve disease program is now exploding, and I've actually diverted my last three or four years really to the mitral tricuspid space. We'll talk about primary and secondary MR separately, but uh, I think for this audience, you know quite, um, quite well what the differences are between them. The main difference with the mitral valve is such a complex organ compared to uh, the uh, aortic valve, which is uh, relatively stagnant. And the, the relationship that we have uh, in understanding mitral valve, I think we're still at the very beginning stages of, of, of how to understand the mitral valve. Uh, I still, 16 years into my practice, I'm still trying to understand uh, the mitral valve. I think echo is absolutely key. You have some of the best echocardiographers here in the Methodist system, um, and we're fortunate to have uh, Manny Vannon and, and Venkat Pulsani and others uh, also in our institution. But the 2022 toolbox for MR has to be phenomenal. This was an artist's rendition of uh, what was done for me at, at, the Met, uh, at, um, at MedStar, and, and I love this picture because as a surgeon, I've really taken to heart that you can have transapical access, you can have mitral clip, you can have neocords. We really have a surgeon specifically have to think out of the box on how we can treat patients. So the pathway for primary MR and the treatment strategy is, in my mind, still not defined very well. And this is just something from uh, 2019 of how to deal with these patients. But let's just be honest, when you look at high risk, medium risk, and low risk, we haven't figured that pathway out very well. Unlike Taber, where we have a little bit more um, uh, uh, idea of what to do. And when we look at it, kind of a historic paper, at the end of the day, untreated MR is massive amount of population. I know in Houston, Atlanta, uh, we're, we're not doing a great job, and if you look at just one study, only 2% are treated, 49% are untreated and eligible for some type of procedure. We have a lot of work to do in this whole space. So I think that one of the first things that's to look at is what is your patient assessment and what are the therapies? So when Pradeep and I, or Vivek and I, look at these patients, we discuss all of these therapies with them and this is really important for young surgeons, and I promised Mahesh Ramchandani that I would say this, young surgeons have to understand all three components. You can't just be an open surgeon anymore if you want to be the best mitral valve proceduralist. You have to learn transcatheter, and you have to know the medical therapy. It's staggering to me uh, how I, when I look at the medication for every patient with mitral regurgitation, some of them are not even on diuretics. I'm not sure in 2022 how that's not even possible. So I think that we have to look at the STS score, we have to look at frailty, and we have to look at hostile anatomy. I think what we have to do is some patients should go to medical therapy or ASO therapy. Some people have to go to surgery on the lower end of that, and then you'll see some people in the middle. And so we won't go through the details of this, but this conversation is not a two minute, we're gonna open you up and go do your mitral valve. It's a very dedicated process that really requires a lot of attention. At the end of the day, we only see about 16% of functional MR patients that are treated. We see about 50% of degenerative MR patients treated. A lot of work to do for all of us. So for degenerative MR, let's spend our attention on that. There are three techniques. I put replacement in there because believe it or not, a lot of people still get uh, replacement for uh, primary MR. We have to change that, but these are the three things that are uh, options for degenerative MR. For, uh, this is a patient that ended up getting uh, concomitant surgery, so he's a replacement, but for the medical students who don't get to see mitral valve surgery, this is a mitral valve replacement uh, uh, done under sternotomy uh, for a variety of reasons. This patient was having this done, and so the access to the mitral valve can be very nice. 
On the other hand, my preference for is minimally invasive surgery. We don't do robotics like you at Methodist. We do minimally invasive mitral valve surgery where patients really benefit from that. The visualization is uh, outstanding. Here's a P2 prolapse that's being repaired. Um, and for the sake of time, we won't go through the procedure, but you can see that here, this is gonna be a resection. Um, I toggle between uh, resection and, um, and uh, neocords. Uh, about 80% of mine are neocords. Uh, this patient tended to turn out to be a, a straightforward P2 uh, resection. Um, but the visualization is outstanding and can be done uh, very easily now. And you can do two of these cases uh, and be home uh, for your kids' uh, soccer game by four or five o'clock. Um, and, the, and the results have to be excellent. They have to have no MR. This is what we have to tell patients that we're gonna do for them is give them no mitral regurgitation. This, if we're going to put people on cardiopulmonary bypass and cross clamp them, these are the results that we should require. Because there's a lot of, um, if I switch back between minimally invasive and conventional sternotomy, there's a lot of questions about which one to do. I believe, Mahesh, this is for you, so you don't throw anything at me as you told me you were going to. Young surgeons have to learn to do both. In my opinion, this is really important. But this shows you over the time from the STS database, What's happened, you can see that uh, the, the um, uh, overall surgical approach has become more and more minimally invasive, but we've got to work harder and we've got to teach and dedicate and spend dedicated time teaching young surgeons to do minimally invasive. If you're a young surgeon listening to this, you've got to find a pathway to do this because this will become critically important to your future, in my opinion. And the results are similar now, where before we saw minimally invasive patients doing worse with stroke rates, that's not the case anymore. We do non-contrast CTs for these patients, make sure that we're not um, uh, increasing their stroke rate, and the results are now equivalent. And, and the cross clamp times and their length of stays are better. So I think we have now perfected and will continue to, uh, to perfect minimally invasive uh, techniques, and this should be the mainstay of therapy for primary mitral regurgitation. This is a paper that was recently published in JAMA Cardiology, and, and I thought I threw this in after our discussions last night. Um, your program, Tom, and our program do a lot of minimally invasive and mitral valve surgery, but that's not the case in the United States. I want you to look at the bottom statement here. The median annual hospital mitral valve volume is 26 to a, to a month. That's it. So we have to be careful in saying, oh, just it's okay, just go repair to replacement. We've got to figure out, do we have a staggered program? Do we send these complex patients or a straightforward P2 prolapse to, to surgeons who are gonna spend a lot of time or hospitals that are ready to, ready to do this? Because this is a problem. And when we look at volume outcome association, uh, a, a beautiful paper by Vinay in 2020, also from the SDS database, the bottom sentence is where I want you to concentrate on the median surgeon mitral valve repair volume is five per year. Tom, that's staggering. So I think that we have to rethink how we're gonna do mitral valve surgery in the United States. This is a really big issue. I think that we, you as the upcoming STS president and, and others uh, who do a lot of valve surgery need to think about how do we deal with this and making sure that patients aren't getting sternotomies and or replacement for primary mitral regurgitation. Let's go to something that's really a big passion of mine now is, uh, is non-surgical um, pathways for treating mitral regurgitation. There are two pathways, transapical and transeptal, and I'll show you both of those. The only FDA approved is uh, mitroclip uh, for mitral regurgitation. For those of you who haven't seen what this looks like, this is not a human being, but you can see what it looks like. This is what a clip uh, looks like when it's coming in at the A2, P2 area, and you're able to, while the heart's beating, you can see a, a mock uh, rupture of a cord you can see what you're able to do is come inside. Uh, this is what Sachin and, and Moritz and Mike are, are doing. You're able to then, uh, here at this program, uh, you're able to close down, uh, create an alpha uri stitch and, and perform a, a mitral clip. What does it look like in the United States? Mike Mack uh, recently published this from the uh, STS ACC TVT registry database. This, by the way, has never been uh, presented nationally. Um, and this is the most contemporary data that you'll see. I wanted to show you, before I show you what the tier database looks like, I wanted to show you, Tom, what has happened in the TAVR space. This is my only slide on TAVR. The orange is the number of TAVRs done in 2020, 82,000. 
the number of surgical valve replacements, all surgical, AVR cabbage, AVR mitral, any time an aortic valve was operated on was 50,000. So you can see that crossover occurred in 2018. Let me now show you what is going on with mitral valves. This is a brand new slide here at Methodist. You're seeing it for one of the first times ever nationally presented. This is the top is, we call it the mitral valve universe slide. Every mitral valve done in the United States is represented here. In last year, 20,000 times a mitral valve was intervened by a surgeon in the U.S. This, black, this line here that you see rising rather rapidly is now mitral clip. So mitral clip now is uh, getting, uh, there will be 14,000 in 2021 estimated. So you can see what's happened since 2014. So you are seeing an increase in transcatheter management, whether you like it or not, this is coming. Um, when you look at Tavertier and TMVR, which is um, sapien mainly in mitral valve or, uh, uh, or um, repairs, you can see at the ages. So a Taver and Tier ages are right on top of each other. In 2021, the average age for a Taver or a Tier was 78. For a TMVR was 74. We won't talk much about TMVR. That's mainly the sapien and mitral um, redos, but you can see they're a little bit younger patients. So we're, you can see, Tom, we've gone from 82 to 78. That creep is occurring, and I think we have to be open to that, but we have to watch, the, watch very carefully. In the United States, there are 507 sites doing tier. That number is growing. You can see the volume of patients annualized are 14,000 patients. I think by the next year, we'll probably have Tom 17, 18,000 in 2022. Median age is dropping. The etiology is changing. DMR initially was 78% of the population. Now it's 60%. So FMR is really going up and we'll spend a little bit of time on that. I still think we need to work on this. 24% of patients, Tom, had a mean gradient of greater than five. That means that those patients are gonna struggle in a couple of years. As that tissue scars down even more, this is early mean gradients. Imagine what's gonna be in a year or two years. We've gotta work on this. 93% of patients, however, had uh, mo uh, less than moderate. So 7% of patients, Tom, had moderate, severe, or severe. That number has gotten better, and we'll need to see that number get even better because you and I can't have a 10% moderate, severe, end of the case, right, uh, 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 mitral regurgitation. We need to get this, in my opinion, less than 5%, less than 2%. If we're going to go into younger patients, this number has got to drop below 5% in my mind. The mortality is still high at one year, 21%. Remember, these are high risk and operative patients. As we get into lower risk, we can't have a 21% one year mortality, Tom. That's not going to be able to work. But you can see so far we're doing great within a hospital in 30 day. The stroke rate is relatively low. And you can see that more patients enter before NY, before tier, they have a high class three and class four heart failure. At the end of the procedure, they feel really good. Most of these patients are in one and two. The length of stay down is now down to one. Tom, you and I can't beat that, let's be honest. Um, but we have to keep our outcomes high. This is going into younger risk patients. Tom, there are two studies, um, one called the Repair MR trial by Abbott, which is an intermediate risk patients. Um, uh, a randomized trial between surgery and mitral clip. And now starting up an NHLBI, Cardiac Surgery Network study, which is looking at low risk patients. Comparing them, clip versus surgery. So um, this is coming um, uh, very quickly and I think that we have to be prepared for it. The second pathway coming forward, and I believe that this uh, technology, um, Tom, should be approved in 2022. So there will be a second um, uh, player on the market. This is uh, one of my cases with um, uh, Pradeep and Vivek. And you can see here, you can, there's a second Pascal device. And this is what we left the patient with, Tom, right? So I would say that that's a pretty good result. Will that compare in low risk patients? Can we do that? I think this, this result, if it stays the way it is, I think is comparable to surgery. That's what I think our goal really needs to come out to. And by the way, here's the data, at, here's the patient at one month. So you see a little bit of residual 
um, of MR. I think this is acceptable in my mind. This is one from November of last year, so a very contemporary result. So I think you know we're, we're showing that we can do it uh, well, but we have to pick the best patients for that. The class 2D trial has fully enrolled. And uh, Tom, I think that this will be able to um, have its results hopefully soon and will go through the FDA pathway. This is a technology that I'm super excited about. This does keep the surgeons involved. Um, this is a harpoon technology, and uh, I want to show you a case. So this is Fred Mila and myself um, uh, doing this case. This is transapical non-bypass. Um, this was just done about uh, a couple of months ago. We, uh, Fred and I were able to put a video together for this. Transapical, eight French sheath. We have uh, heparinized, and boom, here we are. And so you can see um, Fred is taking this, uh, the shaft of the device, and we're putting it right up against the uh, beating heart under echo guidance. Not in a hybrid room, regular OR. Fred, myself, and an echocardiographer, and we're able to do this while the heart's beating. And here you can see, um, uh, as this video plays here, there is a pre-op echo, bad MR, right? I mean, even both of us are surgeons, but we'll say that this is bad MR. <laughs> Uh, and here you can see what the results are. Here you can see um, the, you can see, appreciate right here, four neocords we put in. And you can see the little dots there. Each one of those is a knot. And this is what we showed. Now we've, we have now completed putting in uh, four or five cords. And now we're going to tie this on the transapical uh, epicardial surface. Uh, I put a clamp there, and Fred's going to tie these cords down. And this is the result, Tom. I'd say that's pretty darn good. So I think that this is uh, here, you can see the cords uh, right here, and you can see, I would say, I'm comfortable with calling this no MR, or maybe somebody uh, would call this trace, but I think this looks pretty good. Surgeons doing this, which uh, really great, great um, uh, results in my opinion. And this was from 2021. This was one of the first patients we did, N of one. And now I've done, I've seen this patient at six months, um, the patient has no residual MR. So at six months, we're, we're very happy with the results. This, of course, we need to follow this. I'm fortunate to be leading this trial with Costas um, and also 40 other sites in the United States. So when I look at primary MR and I look at a low risk or medium risk patient, this is our pathway in when Pradeep, Vivek, and I talk to the patients. If they're low to intermediate risk, we're saying we will try to put them into the Harpoon trial. I just showed you that technology. We're also going to think about primary trial for them, which is the randomized trial for CLIP versus uh, surgery. For us, research is paramount. So these are the first conversations we have. If they're medium risk patients, we'll look at them for the repair MR trial, uh, CLIP uh, versus surgery. If they don't fall into any of these three trials, then we'll then look at them for minimally invasive surgery. And then lastly, open, ma open surgery, mainly because they need concomitant procedures. That's our pathway for low and medium risk patients uh, for our heart team. When we now look at primary MR for high risk or inoperative patients, our first pathway was class 2D trial. That's now done. So we will look at them for TMVR, um, the Summit, the Apollo, and a, and a litany of stuff, and I'll show you that stuff next. If they don't fit into these trials, we then will look at them for mitral club. If for some reason we don't think we'll have a great mitral clip result, then we'll think of them for open surgery. For these high risk or not, uh, patients, I put minimally invasive as a lower pathway for me. And the reason is, I believe that in these patients, you need to be on and off bypass quickly and get out of there. And so minimally invasive for me, it's about a 30 to 40 minute longer bypass run. So I actually will go to open surgery in lieu of minimally invasive. That's just my own personal feeling for that. Let's now skip over to secondary MR. Again, uh, a your intervention kind of pathway, and you'll be able to review this for those afterwards. There's a little bit more controversy on what to do with this, um, but you can see there's a pathway here for this also. Functional MR is very uh, tough thing to deal with. Tom, you know this, I know this. Um, it's a very difficult population. We've studied this in the NHLBI. Um, and this is what we saw when we compared repair and replacement. In repair patients, very small series, but in repair patients, we saw a recurrence of mitral regurgitation in 60% of patients at two years. Replacement, we saw 3.8% recurrence. This is driven 
Uh, and here this is shown graphically. Um, you see death going up. You see uh, uh, with recurrent MR, death goes up. The line, I drew these lines because they're parallel. When you leave somebody with recurrent MR, they will die. And I think that this is something that we have to be very vigilant about. I don't mind whichever technique you use, repair or replacement. It's just you can't have them have recurrent MR. This is analogous to TAVR PVLs. You leave them with PVLs, they will die sooner. So whatever your technique is, we just have to make sure they don't have recurrent MR. If you're a surgeon that does a lot of repairs and you think you're going to do papillary muscle relocations and all the techniques, you just don't want to leave them with MR, and that's the important part. This is what we showed. This is a presentation I, I did at the STS years ago. This is what's happened since the trials, after the CTSN publication. More patients before the publication were repairing these patients, and now they're replacing these patients. I think surgeons need to be smart about what they do. Just don't leave them with MR. The most important thing, and it bothers me, that a lot of cardiologists, non-interventional or interventional cardiologists, will send us patients without GDMT. Functional MR patients um, must have GDMT, if, and that's the first thing I look at after talking to the patient about symptoms, I look at their medication list. And commonly, we'll see those patients back in four weeks, eight weeks, because they're not even on, on diuretics. They're not on the best uh, medication. We have to get better about that. It's really, really important. Surgeons, when you see these patients, please don't operate on these patients. I'll give you an, an, one example. I had a patient come to me from a second opinion from across town. The patient had been scheduled for a Bentol mitral valve replacement. EF was 15% time. Had already been put on the books. So they found me somewhere somehow from a, uh, a friend of theirs who lived across the street from them. I looked at the patient, a young guy. He's 55 years old and had been booked. Uh, by the way, he needed a cabbage too. So cabbage times two, a bentol, mitral valve replacement, EF 15 to 20%. I sat the guy, he sat in front of me and I looked at his meds, huffing and puffing. I looked at his meds, I said, um, you know, you've been, he said, yeah, I'm booked for surgery in four days. In fact, I've already done my pre-op at that hospital. And I said, but you're not on a diuretic. And I said, you're about to have a big deal here because you need circ rest. So circ rest, bentol, mitral valve, cabbage times two. I said, I have, how, how about this? How about you give me a month with you and then you can have your surgery? I sent him downstairs to heart failure. We started diuretics on him. Two months later, I, he was called an emergency operation. Two months later, I actually operated on him. His MR went completely away. So I did a bentol, cabbage time, comple completely away. So I repeated his echo at a month. I repeated his echo at two months, his MR. And so I said, and we put him on a bunch of drugs. His blood pressure, by the way, in the, his blood pressure ran 160. So he had hypertensive on no medication. You can profoundly, the guy had a bentol, that's all he needed, bentol, cabbage, and he went on. And so we have to do a better job at this. Of course, everybody knows the QAB trial. I won't spend much time on this, all except to say that uh, the mitral clip uh, tier is uh, beneficial in these patients and the right type of patients if you do good pre and post GDMT. Their all cause mortality gets better compared to just GDMT alone. Their death and their heart failure hospitalization also improves. There is a CLASP 2F trial which is ongoing using the PASCAL trial. I'm fortunate to uh, be um, uh, help running this with Brian Wisenat and Paul Grayburn. And uh, this trial is also enrolling. Where I'll spend some energy now, Tom, is mitral valve replacement. I think this is the future for um, uh, ischemic or functional mitral regurgitation. I have my most experience with the tendine valve. I think um, here you have most of your experience at this hospital with the intrepid valve. So just to familiarize at least this audience with this, a tendine valve is done transapically. Um, I've now done about 30 of these in three different institutions. Um, and uh, what you're able to do is get, after you get a apical access, you're able to deploy the valve. It has a suture that's uh, as a pad is uh, placed um, on the ventricular epicardium. Um, in fact, I have three of these that I'm scheduling in the month of May that have been already approved. And so this is a, a, a future technology. And here, Tom, I'm just showing a case that's been done. It's kind of nice to look at. Uh, there's no residual MR at all, zero. And here is on a transthoracic, you can see that cord that's right here, and it's attached to a buckle, uh, like a wafer on the epicardial surface. Um, 
The procedure for me to do this once I've gained access with the device, a sheath in the apex, is about eight to 10 minutes. Heparinize, get apical access, do a little bit, make sure you haven't caught a cord. The sheath goes in, eight minutes later, you pull the sheath out and you're done, eight to 10 minutes. And so very similar to the Intrepid device, we just have done this a little bit more. Um, and here you can see zero MR and you can see what it looks like on a 3D echo um, post-op. Over 500 of these patients have now been done worldwide. Um, here's 100 patients uh, that we were able to publish um, in Jack in 2019. What we show at 12 months is 98% no mitral regurgitation. So you can completely get rid of the mitral regurgitation. Vinay published this data uh, last year at uh, ACC. What we were, despite getting the MR, we still have a 8% mortality in these patients. So I think that as I show you transapical technology, I think it will disappear in five years because they still require intubation. It's, I mean, um, uh, an apical incision, you're putting a 35, 40 French sheath or into the apex of the heart. And I think that <clears throat> it's still an issue. You're seeing, um, Tom, you're still seeing a 16% mortality in nine days. The results are great. And by the way, we're leaving no MR. So it's not the residual MR pitch. I think there's other stuff going on in these patients. Look, this 99% none to trivial MR. So we've got to figure out what to do. The patients feel better, but we still have a 8 to 15% 90-day mortality. These are our main predictors for mortality, age over 80. Patients with severe pulmonary hypertension, those uh, with first two implants, if they did, you know, in their, in their uh, learning curve, and if they had a prior, uh, prior uh, cabbage was protective. The summit trial is ongoing um, and uh, we are working on that component of it. Currently it is a randomized trial that we're all, all enrolling into. This is what your program has a lot of experience in and we've done you know 20, 25 Intrepids, we've done 20 um, uh, uh, Tendine, so we have done about 40, 45 of these and you, you've been doing this technique, uh, again transapical uh, technique, the STS PROM was about 6%, so a higher risk patient population. Their mortality was 14% at 30 days, uh, over 30 days an additional 9.8%. So, uh, you know, we still need to figure out, yes, we're getting rid of the MR, but what's going on? And here you can see a 20% mortality at a year. Uh, um, we, we still haven't perfected uh, what's going on with this. And, and take a look, and we have but almost all these patients are less than mild MR. So we're getting rid of, uh, very nicely getting rid of the mitral regurgitation. This is a single arm treatment study for the Intrepid, and so that's kind of the pathway. A lot of these patients get screened out because of neo-LV, uh, LVOT issues. Um, I think here you can see in the more uh, contemporary expansion, you can see that now they have a 2%, so we're making progress, but it's still something after 30 days we're seeing mortalities. We still need to perfect this procedure. This is, I think, what will be replacing transapical mitral valve replacement. This is a paper just came out in Jack Intervention. Um, and, and, you know, Mike was a part of this, Mike Reardon was a part of this, where you're able to do transeptal femoral vein mitral valve. Here you can see none mitral regurgitation. And here you can see the NYJ classification is unbelievably better. So here, now, Tom, we're starting to see some differences. Zero 30 day mortality zero stroke rate. Now we're starting to make some difference. And I think this is the future transfemoral, transeptal mitral valve replacement. I'll show you some cool cases now. Here is the M3. We just did one patient uh, for the M3. This is an Edwards uh, system where you uh, have a loading dock and then you come in and deploy a valve in. I did one of these cases not too long ago and I have a second one coming up in about two weeks. And here's what it looks like. You have a docking station and then you're able to put a sapien valve inside of this. I'm very happy with this valve. It took us about two hours and 20 minutes to do this. Femoral vein stick. Patient went home in a day. So this to me will make a difference. Um, just some data to show that it's done very well um, and the MR goes away. So I think this is something that we're gonna be spending a lot more energy on. Here's another program called the Evoke. This is in early feasibility trials right now. Again, transeptal, you can see the sheath at the top right hand uh, corner and you're able to deploy the valve uh, transfemorally uh, through the femoral vein. And this is a, just a, a, another beautiful program. It's like the um, transeptal um, uh, evoke uh, that I, sh or transfemoral intrepid that I showed you. 
This is the initial results with that. Again, great resolution of mitral regurgitation. Look at the death rate, one. So I think we're starting to now make some heavy progress into this. We did the first one of these in North America recently, um, uh, uh, four or five months ago in 2021. What this does, Tom, you come up the femoral artery, you're able to come across the aortic valve, you're able to create a lasso around the mitral valve apparatus, and then what you're able to do once you've done that is now you've created a docking port, and then you come transeptal with the mitral valve and, and completely deploy your valve. We have four more patients submitted to this, so hopefully we'll have another one um, coming up soon. Um, after uh, here, you can see the docking station is being implanted uh, into this, uh, and then you come in transeptal uh, to do the procedure uh, quite uh, simply. So that's, that's the next pathway, I think. I'll just skip that. Here you can see our patient um, that uh, Pradeep and I and Vivek, the three of us are doing this procedure here. Here we've completed a transfemoral. It took us two hours to do the procedure. Patient went home, is doing great four months later. There is uh, no risk of LVOT obstruction with a, high, with a high life, so I think that's the one benefit for it. Uh, the data shows that there's really almost no residual mitral regurgitation. There are challenges with uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Here you can see one of our patients well seated uh, at implantation. Now you have severe MR. And so this is the type of stuff that we'll have to deal with. Here you can see an LVOT obstruction peak gradient 94. Tom, that's not good. So here's a valve that's been deployed and now severe LVOT obstruction. Here's a valve you can see now with, with partial thrombosis of the valve. These are very uh, nasty complications that we will have to start to deal with. I'm gonna switch a little bit to MAC. This is a paper we published uh, on MAC uh, because there's a lot of technology towards this. Here's a tendine in MAC where we now are able to do a transapical mitral valve replacement for these patients. Here's uh, one of our patients where you can see you have uh, severe MR, severe MAC in this patient. We're able to go ahead and deploy the valve with um, transapical technology with zero residual MR and a great result. Uh, these patients, I think it's a really benefit to this. This study is randomizing now. Some patients we do, this is for the um, uh, cardiologist mainly. You can see this is what a mitral valve, a severe MAC is, and we're able to directly put a sapien valve into these patients. This is called what we call the hybrid sapien, uh, and you guys do this uh, well in this program, but that's another technology that's being used where we can put a sapien valve and then just put in a couple of stitches uh, to put this together. So my algorithm for secondary MR, if they're low and intermediate risk, they get minimally invasive to open surgery, um, and then if they have a uh, high risk or prohibitive, they'd go into the class 2F trial, they'd go into a TMVR trial, they'd go to mitral clip, or they'd go to open mitral valve surgery. And that's really our pathway for secondary MR for these patients. I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on tricuspid before we end this. Um, I think that this is a massive population. It's no longer forgotten. We're really spending a lot of energy on this. If you have severe TR, you do poorly. We have to figure out how to do this. About a third of my clinic now is severe TR. A third of my clinic is severe TR now. There are a lot of treatment modalities. None of them have worked very well in my opinion. None of them. Except, and here I'll just show you one. This is a tri-clip. This is, I chose this video because it's one of the best results you'll ever see. Here is a tri-clip. You have pre with three clips. You do a major uh, benefit, but you're taking it usually from torrential and severe. This is um, a case from Pradeep uh, that he let me borrow, um, and so we did a great job. He did a great job with this and Vivek, but this isn't common. You're still leaving them usually with moderate TR. And the results aren't bad, uh, but they're not perfect. This is where I think the future is. This is the first implant in January 2021, and I think this is what really I think the future is um, for this is trans femoral trans uh, replacement of these patients. Here you'll see we're through a femoral vein needle stick, we're bringing up a device. And here, Tom, you can see that we're gonna replace this valve. This is the evoke pathway. Uh, we now, um, as I showed you in the introductory slide, we were able to do a lot of these last year. This is uh, Pradeep, Vivek, and myself um, doing this case. And now what we're doing is we're slowly unraveling this valve. You can see the RCA has some calcium in it. Um, now we're slowly unraveling and doing a tricuspid valve replacement 
remarkable procedure. I think we have two or three of these coming up in the next uh, uh, week or two. So now we're able to do this. We keep these patients for pay, uh, just to make sure they don't need a pacemaker. And now this patient's done. This takes us about an hour and 15 minutes to do this procedure. Um, so that's, and here's the results, Tom, uh, almost no TR for these patients. So Shiel, uh, recently in Jack Interventions, papers have been published on this. Uh, the results are unbelievable uh, with the resolution of the uh, TR severity and a, a staggeringly improvement in the NYHA in the six meter walk and also the KCCQ. Um, I'll skip to this and maybe Tom, I'll just end with some innovation words. I think that leaders are created during periods of innovation. I think this is very important and this is a book uh, by Bill George, if, uh, who is a past CEO of Medtronic. You know, spend some time. I think that you have phenomenal people here like Moritz, who's coming up, and Cosm, who's a, uh, your, your f super fellow here. Find time to become leaders during periods of innovation. Um, I've been fortunate to have uh, bulldogs like Mike Mack and Mark Reardon, who have really broken down barriers for, for people like me. Um, uh, all the credit goes to them, but this is a time to do that. However, you have to do it with ethics. This is very important. We have to be stewards in doing investigation, but we have to be even big stewards in doing this ethically and monitoring the data. And I'll end with this, that these are my tenets for innovation and quality. The heart is the basis of the tree of life. You have to resist amnesia and you have to lead by example and never forget that our profession remains the noblest of the noble and the bravest of the brave. Resist egotism. We have, we have been and remain the drivers of innovation in medicine and surgery. It's in our genetic makeup and in the blood that runs in our veins. But you have to remain humble, and this is really important. Resist mediocrity. I know, Tom, this really resonates with you. I think this is the fungus that poisons the tree of life and erodes our historical genealogy and stymies our greatness for the future. Be your best, whatever that is, and resist complacency. If you're not moving forward, then you are moving backwards. And if the soil within your roots has not constantly changed over time, you will wither away and you'll become irrelevant. I thought of these things, excel in the present, be the future. I thought about this when I was listening to this, this woman. This is a cover of her album. And as I saw this, Lori McKenna, uh, McKenna as I saw these, these four things kind of came into my mind as I looked at this picture, um, and I just wanted to, to just um, uh, share that with you. So innovations in the management of mitral and tricuspid disease are increasing dramatically. Trials are under, get underway ex from extreme risk to low risk, and all of these technologies are progressing slower than TAVR. There has been significant progress in the last one to two years and maybe significant, I believe, portion of mitral tricuspid therapies in the next five years will be done this way. So, Tom, once again, I'm humbled, I'm honored um, to be uh, here with you and, and, and the team at the Methodist, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, Vino, uh, thank you so much for a spectacular talk. I would say that uh, the title of it should be changed rather than <laughs> the Wild Wild West. I would say it should be the Wild Wonderful Ways of taking care of patients. I mean, it, it really, you have shown us the toolbox that exists for helping us uh, get patients better. Uh, I have several questions for you, and I would love to get those of you who are watching, uh, I'd like to get your uh, thoughts and questions uh, for Vino. Uh, but while we're waiting for those, so Vino, I know that you're passionate about the multidisciplinary team. Right. And, and uh, as I look around the country, the programs and the people who have been really successful are those who have mastered the multidisciplinary team. Right. You know, we've learned these lessons from transplant. That's right. You know, where the surgeons, the cardiologists, the immunologists come together and they really do the best for the patient. But it's a little bit different. Yep. You have a group of individuals with individual skill sets that are different. You know, 20 years ago, a surgeon did surgery. Right. Cardiologist did intervention. Images did imaging. We now are in a world where those boundaries and techniques are now 
mixed. Yeah, blurred, right? They're blurred, and right. so it, it's so. How teach us how how do you get a group of people together to work together for a common goal in the multidisciplinary team? What's your what's your special sauce? You know, um, having now been at three institutions. Um, Emory, uh, where you know Robert Guyton was was my mentor and, and who you know very well, and is um, a second father to me, um, instilled that in me when I was there with him for almost uh, 20 years. Um, but we didn't do it perfectly well because we had a lot of different. We weren't able to. Uh, Vasilis and I worked phenomenally well together, but we had another 10 surgeons where it was difficult to do that. And yeah. whenever somebody received a console, they just did it. Right? There wa it wasn't a valve center focus where every patient, what we uh, wanted to bring to the valve center, the surgeon could still operate on it, but we wanted the whole team to see them and make decisions for research trials or other pathways. Um, DC, I got a little closer with that. Uh, Lowell Sattler, absolutely uh, one of my favorite people in the world, um, mm -hmm. really believed in that. And rarely would he take, uh, almost never would he take somebody to the cath lab without discussing it with myself and a guy named Amar Bafi who did most of the mitral tricuspid work. But it was, there were still separate pods. And I don't know how it happened, but I just landed in a place with Pradeep and Vivek where um, every single valve patient comes through the valve center. And except the endocarditis patients or the ruptured papillary muscle mm -hmm. patient, all patients come through the valve center. We discuss them on a three hour calls between Thursday and Friday. We have imagers, we have every patient's presented. Even if I have a straightforward P2 prolapse, that goes to the valve. I will take my patient to the valve team meeting and we will discuss it and make sure we're doing the right thing. And we have Fred Mila and myself uh, do almost all the mitrals there surgically, Jim Cowden also. But the point is, is that every patient is reviewed. And I think we've, I'm not sure how, I think it's just luck, Tom, but we've decided that that's important. So there is no, um, that the part of that problem is, however, is that, you know, in the worlds of our views and salaries, that's been maybe difficult to do in the other two programs for me, hmm. but somehow we've been able to decide that's the best thing for our patient and that's the pathway that we'll take. And when we see patients, Tom, it's, we're seeing them at the same time. Hmm. They don't come three weeks later to see a surgeon. They see them that day in our clinic that's jointly with the valve center. I think we have to rethink the paradigm of how we're gonna treat valve disease. Once we make that paradigm shift is I think when we'll start making the biggest impact uh, for that. I think you do it great here. I think every program can be refined, just like ours can probably be refined also. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point, Vino, is that to kind of change our philosophy from what can I do right. to what should we do. And for the patient. For the patient. That's right. Yeah, for the patient. And, and, and you're, you know, the, the, mecha, the, you know, the mechanics of it, uh, you know, more and more, you know, the, the business of medicine right. is RVUs. It's, you know, focused on the individual, what the individual does. And I do think that uh, programs in hospitals moving forward will be the most successful if they can create a structure that rewards everybody for functioning well together. That's right. I mean, think of what's happened at TAVR reimbursement from an administration side versus surgery, right? I mean, I think we're going to have to partner with our administrators about this too. We can't gut the surgeons as we move into transcatheter. I think we've got to find that balance. We need cardiologists. They need us. It's not one or the other. So I've quite, just to switch gears a little bit, uh, I mean, it's, it's striking to watch uh, some of the videos of the techniques that you have. And, uh, and even though the, the technology and the techniques are less invasive and less of an insult, if you will, to the patients, you know, some of the mortality is still it's pretty high. high. That's right. And so I guess the question is, with, with changing techniques and technology, should we change the indications? I mean, is it, is it what we do or when we do it that has the impact that's a great that's a that's a great point and it's one of my soapboxes especially in fmr hmm. uh, you know i have to be honest with you i'm tired of seeing a ef of 15 percent fmr patient and i go back on epic now you can because you can see other programs right and i look at it and it says patient doing well severe mr ef 55 percent we'll continue to watch <laughs> ef of 45 percent severe 
FMR will continue doing okay, we'll continue to watch. EF of 25%. EF 15, oh yeah, let's send them to the valve center now. Now I see them, what am I gonna do with an EF of 15% FMR patient at this point? We aren't doing a great job in managing these patients early on. So I advocate just getting the patient to the valve center. Maybe we don't do anything at this point, but having them see Moritz or Mike or Sasha earlier will benefit our patients. I believe we're doing a dis disservice to patients, an injustice yeah. to patients, but not seeing uh, a valve center ahead of time. Maybe not therapy, mm -hmm. but at least getting them plugged in. That's a big thing that we have to work on on a national level. Um, on the ACC side, the STS side, the AHA side, we really have to figure out that paradigm shift needs to occur, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, in the past, it's been the balance of, you know, what's the risk of the natural history of the disease? What's right. the risk of the intervention? And, and I think that what, what you've shown is that these interventions that, you know, are much less of an insult right. that fixes the underlying pathophysiology, maybe it's the right thing at the wrong time. That's right, and as we move into more femoral techniques, I think, I think people have been scared to send us to us, Tom, as surgeons, quite honestly. They're gonna go crack your chest open, don't go, you know, wait till you really need it. But now when we, as we have technology that are needle sticks, I think that paradigm shift hopefully will change sooner than later. You know, and you know, some, of the, you know, some of the lessons that we've learned are applicable to the new technologies. You know, we, we've known for years with valve replacement, if you leave people with paravalvular leaks, right. they don't do well. Right. And I think it's not just paravalvular leaks with, with surgical valve replacement, transcatheter valve replacement right. too. We, we've known even for years, if you do a mitral valve repair surgically, right. and you leave people with residual MR. Yeah, more than mild, yeah. They don't do well. Right. And, and so how do, we, how do we kind of teach those lessons moving forward rather than having to relearn them over and over again? I think it's got to start with education early on. And it's the newer generation of surgeons that, and, and part of it, Tom, I think is our fault too, as, mm -hmm. our, as the mentors to a lot of young, young people. If, if, our, if we leave people with mild, moderate MR, then they're going to do the same thing. So I think our training paradigm has to change where we've got to, for instance, let's say somebody does a, a mitral valve repair and they leave them with mild to moderate MR at 30 days. Well, you've got to do something back with that patient. It's not, I think surgeons specifically say, oh, you know, somebody will look at my results and get worried that I've got to reoperate on the patient. It's the right thing to do. I also think a bad repair is worse than a, than a, a, re, a good, good replacement. replacement. Yeah. And I think that, oh my gosh, the cardiologist will never send me a patient again if I replace it but you're actually doing a disservice to the patient by leaving them with mild to moderate MR. So I think we've got to, we as surgeons have to think better and sometimes it's okay to replace somebody than to leave them with residual MR. So we've just got to think about the patient, not necessarily our own individual practice. I think if we do that, we'll end up rebalancing that and then our, our residents and our trainees will also have that mindset. This is a little bit of a third rail, but uh, you know, it, it's striking when you look at the data with mitral valve surgery, how many surgeons do so I few? Just, I can't believe it. Procedures, and so I mean, does that? Re I mean, does that just scream out that we need to regionalize I, I'd, care? It does. It really does. I mean, you know, uh, I know you guys have four or five this week. You know, and the same with Fred and I and and Jim in, at Piedmont. But how is that? I mean. I'm, if I did a procedure every three months, you can't tell me that I'm going to do a great job with it. And the data shown that over and over again. I just don't know how to regionalize it and take away from these smaller hospitals. I don't know, I don't know if that's on a, on, a, on a governmental level, insurance level, societies um, level. I think everybody's been so nervous and in cracking into that, but somewhere we're going to have to make that change to regionalized care, in my opinion. Yeah, but I, but, but I, you know, at least in my thought, in my opinion about this, it isn't about taking patients away from their doctors. Right. It's partnering with them. It's, it's right. coming up with a process that, you know, the, multi, the expanded heart team becomes geographically expanded. Because, you know, patients, you know, patients don't want to fly no. from Montana 
to Maryland. That's right. You know, they don't want to go from... They don't want to drive two hours. They don't want to drive two yeah, hours. And, right. they, and, they, and they want to be cared for by, by the people Local. who... They're local. Especially with a family. And look, you, you live in a metropolis here in Houston, just like Atlanta. We're in the heart of uh, uh, Piedmont's in the heart of Atlanta. You're in the heart of Houston. It, it, just to drive from the perimeter of Houston inside is an hour and a half drive. Same with us. And so, um, but we've got to figure this out because doing five procedures a year, I'm not sure is the right thing to do. And I guess last question, because we're running out of time. This has been yeah. great. You know, it's uh, for all of the, the medical folks listening out there, I mean, I think Vino, you gave a really a great shout out to the merits of medical therapy. And, and I think it's very easy as an interventionalist, as a surgeon, to think that the only solution is when we do some kind of intervention. Right. But, I, but I think that, that some of the studies that you showed, certainly the ischemia trial has right. shown That's that right. medical therapy is effective. And it's not one or the other, it's, it's the melding them together. It's adjunctive therapy. It's adjunctive therapy. But it starts there though. And just like the example yeah. of the bentol cabbage mitral valve, I mean, I converted someone with high risk surgery to a easier risk surgery. The guy did great. And I think we've got to be careful in just diving in with a knife. I think we have to be more thought provoking on this. Well, Vino, once again, thank you very much. And I would really like to thank all of you who have been watching uh, and listening. Uh, at home. This has been a great Grand Rounds. Uh, and for any of you who have any uh, further questions or comments for Vino, please feel free to get in touch with us and we'll get them to Vino. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks for tuning in.